Good evening and welcome to NASA's Kennedy Space Center in Florida for the SpaceX CRS-11 post-launch news conference. We wouldn't be here if it weren't a tremendously successful day, and we're all very pleased to be here. And I'm happy to be joined uh, by, to my left, Mr. Ven Fen, manager of the International Space Station Transportation Integration Office at Johnson Space Center in Houston. And to his left, Hans Koenigsman. SpaceX Vice President of Build and Flight Reliability and the Chief Engineer on Console for today's successful launch. Gentlemen, thank you for joining me. Thank you, Michael. And we'll start off with uh, some opening statements. Great. Uh, it's great to be here. Thank you very much. Um, and congratulations to our SpaceX colleagues. Another uh, wonderful launch. We're very much looking forward to having uh, Dragon, Dragon to come back to Space Station on Monday at 10 a.m. Eastern. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Hans? I'm uh, super happy, as always, after a good launch. <laughs> and um, I do want to really thank NASA for the opportunity to bring up cargo and, uh, and, and, and do what we, uh, what we love to do, launching rockets and uh, deploying spacecraft. And um, also like to uh, like the opportunity to thank the, the team. Falcon 9 team did uh, super great today. Um, and uh, Pat team worked, worked um, awesome. Dragon team is uh, is very busy right now. I'm pretty sure they're doing they're doing excellent. And then 45th uh, Space Wing and the FAA did uh, support us, uh, you know, in, in a very great way today too. So and and in particular, the person I would like to thank is Mike McAleen. This was not uh, not uh, here at this press conference, but who was at the other press conference for uh, opening the skies and uh, clearing the uh, the clouds and uh, making uh, making it possible to launch. Um, through the Florida afternoon, summer afternoon uh, weather. Um, Dragon is, is on orbit. The uh, solar arrays are deployed. Um, they're working working well. Uh, they're you know pointing to the sun and producing power. Um, we will we will open the uh, guidance and control door um, a little bit later today, and then um, as uh, you already heard, um, Dragon is going to birth. Um, with the station on Monday morning, uh, yeah, at 10, 10, 10 a.m. exactly. Um, and the uh, Falcon 9 second stage has been deorbited. It uh, it landed um, in the ocean southwest of Australia, and um, from what I can tell, the mission was uh, excellent and a great success, and had no uh, no hiccups. Um, the countdown was very smooth, very quiet. Um, I had the opportunity to be back in my chief engineer role today, and uh, I really enjoyed it, enjoyed it uh, greatly, and uh, it was great fun. Maybe I do this again. <laughs> so um, overall, a, a great day. We, we agree. Thank yeah. you, Hans. <laughs> um, okay, at this time we'll take questions. And um, for those of you who are following on social media, please use the hashtag AskNASA. Emily from our NASA social media group is here to uh, – facilitate getting your questions out. If you're in the room, please raise your hand if you have a question. Wait for the radio microphone. State your name and affiliation and to whom you're addressing your question, and we'll go ahead and take questions. Uh, Chris, here in the front row. Uh, Chris Gebhardt with NASA Space Flight, um, with one for both of you. Um, for Hans, I'm wondering if you can uh, talk a little bit about recovery operations for the booster. I understand this is the first time you're going to start streamlining some of those processes for recovering the booster once it's landed. Um, uh, and for the NASA question, um, can you talk a little bit about Cygnus um, being unberthed about a month ahead of when it was originally scheduled to? Thank you. Okay, so I mean, thank, thank, thanks for that question because I, I um, should also mention the first stage landed really, really well on the uh, landing zone run. Um, from what I can tell, was a, a, an excellent centered landing, and uh, and um, we're gonna you know take the next couple of days to uh, to save it, break it over, and then bring it in the hangar and, and inspect it. As you pointed out, um, we're gonna streamline it, so it's gonna be. Um, uh, less inspections probably than the first one, and um, and then we got to decide what we do with that uh, with this particular booster. Okay. Yeah, we'll, oh, go ahead. Sorry, with respect to Cygnus, um, yeah, it's, it's just demonstrating its operational flexibility. So a few months ago, it uh, came up and delivered uh, about 3,000 kilograms worth of um, cargo resupply and research, 
and um, based on its, um, its we got everything out, we got everything back in, it's completely packed, uh, it's full of disposal as well as a few other experiments. So because it's full, we decided since we had this one day opportunity uh, after the launch scrub on um, the first, uh, to go ahead and unbirth Cygnus now, it's got two experiments. It's doing uh, after um, post unbirth. Uh, so it's going to stick around in orbit for about a week. So it's going to do the Sapphire experiment as well as deploy some nano racks, external deployers, uh, external payloads. Uh, Ken. Hi, Ken Kramer from Universe Today and the Northeast Astronomy Forum for, um, for Hunts and for NASA. For Hunts, um, can you talk about um, any improvements that you have made? You've learned lessons from, from landing. We talked about that a little bit before that you learned a couple. I wonder if you have applied any um, to this, to this, to this booster, like the grid fins changing or the paint on the side or, or anything else to the engine that you can tell about about any engines. And um, for the for, for NASA, the how long um, crew supplies we have now uh, with this mission for the astronauts uh, on the ISS. So um, on this one, the, there's a visible change on the landing zone. We um, paint the deck. Um, with something that is more conductive. That's the one you can see when you um, uh, watch the camera on the first stage. Um, other than that, um, we, we fine tune um, minor parts and components, um, not, not overall a whole lot of changes. Nothing to the grid things yet? No. Okay, and with respect to uh, consumables on board, we're, we're in really good shape uh, on board right now. It's uh, greater than six months, I think, in all categories. There is some food going up, and I can get those exact numbers for you afterwards. Uh, but, but really, the utility literally tons of science going up on this. So it's been focused more towards uh, utilization and research. Um, but, uh, but we're in good shape as far as consumables on board. Okay, we'll take a question here, then uh, then we'll go to the phone for a question, and then uh, Emily has a couple of social media questions we'll take. Hi, Stephen Clark from Space Flight Now. A couple of questions, uh, one for each of you, I guess. Uh, for Hans, um, with the two-day weather delay, um, does that impact uh, your launch date uh, mid-June at all uh, for Bulgaria set? And for um, uh, Vin, uh, can you talk a little bit about um, your status on CRS-2, the CRS-2 providers? Um, have you turned on any missions uh, or ordered any missions uh, from any of the three providers that you have under CRS-2 yet? And if so, uh, which ones? Thanks. So with respect to the Bulgaria, the, the next launch, basically, um, it's still mid-June. Uh, mid we got we to gotta evaluate um, if, if anything moves, um, but that's currently that's not, um, not planned for. Um, I guess that was all the questions you had from me, right? Yeah, let's see. Uh, with respect to uh, CRS-2, yeah, all three of our vendors are in very good shape. Uh, they've all completed their uh, first three uh, ISS integration reviews. That was a kickoff. Uh, that was requirements review and then um, a preliminary design type review. And all of them are making progress towards the dates uh, that they need to for their ISS integration portion. Uh, we have turned on one mission uh, so far in CRS-2, and that's an orbital ATK mission. And that was just due to mission needs based on when their uh, CRS-1 uh, when we look at the overall fleet of resupply vehicles out in that time frame and what capabilities they are, uh, there are, and uh, where CRS-1 uh, timing ends up, and we've turned on one mission so far. Okay, let's uh, go to the telephone and take a call from James Dean from Florida Today. James? Hi, thanks so much. I had a couple of questions for Hans. Uh, first, on uh, flight rate, uh, you mentioned before uh, the launch, how that's improving. I wondered if you could comment on you know, what is enabling you to, to sustain this, this pace you've achieved so far this year? And um, I, I think if schedules were to hold, you have a particularly busy stretch coming up with launches from both coasts. Is that a particular challenge for you? Ed? Sorry, I'm not sure I captured the question <laughs> totally. Yeah. James, can you please ask that again? Uh, your audio is just a little bit uh, low here for us to hear. Okay, I'm sorry. I'll try again. Uh, Hans, I wondered if you could comment on your flight rate so far this year. What is enabling you to uh, sustain this pace that you're at right now? And you have a busy stretch coming up with launches from both coasts. Is that going to be a particular challenge for you coming up soon? Uh, okay. Th um, yeah. Th thank you. That's actually, that's actually an excellent question. Um, so a lot of that is um, turning things into routine, I would say, and learning um, 
just to deal with this operation better and better every time. Um, the situation that we launch from both coasts is something that uh, is uh, somewhat new for us. We've had this in, 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 in you know, with a little bit of separation in the past. Um, and uh, we've, uh, we've set up the teams to be able to, to cope with that and uh, basically have the ability to, uh, to launch from both sides uh, within you know, a short uh, time period. Okay, um, we have another caller on the line, uh, Brandon from Space News 360. Hi. Uh, first off, congratulations on the uh, successful reuse of the, uh, the Dragon capsule. Uh, I was wondering, now that you've achieved both the, uh, the first reuse of the first stage and the Dragon capsule, uh, has NASA given any interest in uh, using a reuse core? And if so, what is the, uh, the timeline on that? That question goes to you, right? Or? Yes. So, um, so we are. Uh, that uh, that question has been posed. We uh, we are looking at it. Uh, we are uh, we're evaluating every aspect of it very carefully, and there is no uh, schedule yet uh, when we might um, go down that path. But uh, but we're looking at it. Okay. Perfect. Thanks. Okay. Let's uh, see how things are uh, shaping up on social media, Emily. Do you have some questions? Yeah, thanks, Mike. Uh, this question is from Mary Robinette, and she wants to know, with the successful reuse of the Dragon capsule and Falcon 9's beautiful landing, what's the next milestone you're aiming for? Um, that's a good question. Um, well, we have, um, we have two major uh, milestones coming up with Falcon Heavy and, and Crew Dragon, um, uh, both later this year. So um, uh, that keeps us busy. <laughs> And um, yeah, I would say, I would say those are the, the two the two major major milestones coming up. It's, it's all that that's actually it's, those are pretty big milestones. <laughs> Great. There are two more questions from social media. Uh, this one's from Joe Foster. How many missions do you think you can continue to reuse a Dragon capsule? So we 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 planned for multiple missions um, to be to be able to use Dragon. Um, and when, when this dragon comes back, we will evaluate and see if we, um, you know, I, I described this last time. You have, this is like a, every component has a life, and then every mission takes a little bit off, and you have to have a certain life remaining, basically, in order to do the next mission with margin. Um, and, um, and it depends a little bit on how that, how that works out. Um, if I had to guess, um, probably a couple more. Yeah. This last one's from Matt Camper. He wants to know, how did it feel to be the 100th launch from 39A today? <laughs> Great. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, Chris has a question here in the front row. Uh, yeah, for Hans, um, what's the status of building the new landing pads at LZ-1 in preparation for Falcon Heavy later this year? Ooh, that's an excellent question. I should have actually driven by that. I, uh, I don't think we're done with that yet, but I think we started building it. I mean, it's just a... I, I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't have the time to drive by and take a look. Yeah. Stephen? Hi, uh, Stephen Clark from Spaceflot Now again. Um, uh, your, your next mission, I understand, is sort of a, a longer mission for you, Bulgaria Sat. I think it's something like six hours uh, to spacecraft separation uh, based on what I've heard from your customer. Um, uh, can you talk a little bit about that? mission profile and and uh, what's required to do that sort of injection Thanks. Uh, are you sure um, because I I didn't hear that so far and uh, I would I would have like you I would have be uh, you know I would have paid attention to that and, um, and and looked into this more deeply but um, I have to admit I, I don't have the information on this it's 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 from uh, Bulgaria set they did a, a journalist presentation uh, last week um, can we come back to you and yes. maybe see if we can clarify that? Sure. Because sure. I'd be surprised. Okay, uh, Ken. Hi, Ken Kramer again for Hans. Um, I was just wondering, the Dragon, do you, you have considered using this as, a, as an orbiting science lab in the past. I wonder, do you have any, any missions, any plans, any customers to fly the Dragon in orbit alone? I know. I know we did. We did consider that, and I know we, we worked on that. But I, I don't know what the the current status on this project is, whether we uh, we will do this or, or not. Frankly. Okay, we're uh, 
We're going to get the microphone to question here in the second row. Hi, um, Mary Ellen Jellen from Wave Report Space. Hans, there's um, some question about the damage, that, if there was any damage done to the Dragon on the previous flight, and how was the salt water mitigated? On the previous flight, you mean the flight before this flight, the um, CS? Yes. So this Dragon flew on CRS-4. And um, from what I can tell, there was no particular damage. When I say it takes lives of, of components, that's just normal operation. That's basically just a shaking and rattling that you have during, during launches. And, um, and it's not, not a particular damage per se. It's what the, the part is designed for. Um, I'm not aware of any damage to Dragon on its, you know, beyond that, that usage, uh, the overall, you know, just the, the normal, normal usage on, on, on last flight. Um, and then on the salt water front, um, we've made steady progress to um, to keep the salt water more and more out. Um, just being in a salty atmosphere is usually uh, already uh, pretty pretty bad. So um, my understanding is right now that we've we've, we've cleaned this up pretty well, and uh, and and that allows us to use more and more components. Okay. Um. Emily, do you have any other questions that uh, you'd like to ask at this time? All right, uh, then we'll wrap things up with a final question from Sawyer. Thank you very much, Mike. Sawyer Rosenstein with Talking Space. Uh, for Hans, with the launches picking up now, with there being more of them, and with Block 5 being capable of doing barge or land landings, uh, can you talk a little bit about the process, with, for example, two weeks coming up between launches, in the decision process on barge versus land landings? So the barge versus land landing is always driven by... Um I want to say how much fuel you have left after your main mission, and if you have enough fuel left, you, you return to the land. That's um, in generally easier for us and saves money because we don't have to send the uh, the drone ship out there. Um, in general, it seems that drone ship and land landing are equally. Um, I don't want to say easy, <laughs> but um, for for the rocket itself, um, it seems to be the same basically uh, in terms of. Of, of hitting the the deck and hitting the the, the, the landing spot, or, or rather landing on the right spot, um, so the the decision is literally just um, depending on how how much fuel you have left, and that depends on the orbit, on the satellite, how heavy the satellite is, what kind of mission it is, and um, and all these these factors. So we know this in generally we know this. Um, a while before. I mean, it's not not the two weeks. Um, we know this month ahead of time. Yeah. So then you're working your schedules to adjust to Correct. try and account for the payload for that as well. Yeah. I mean, the two the two weeks. Um, at the at the end of the day, um, we ha we you need to get the vehicle and the payload ready, and um, and we have multiple places where we can do this now. So it's. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Um, before we leave, I wanted to uh, let you know a couple of uh, notes on NASA television. Before Dragon arrives at the space station, as Ven was talking about, Orbital ATK's Cygnus cargo spacecraft is set to depart the station tomorrow. Expedition 52 flight engineers uh, Peggy Whitson and Jack Fisher will be operating the robot arm. NASA television coverage starts at 8.30 a.m. Eastern time for an expected 9.10 a.m. release. And then on Monday, Dragon makes its arrival. NASA television coverage will begin at 8.30 a.m. for an expected capture at about 10 a.m. Eastern Time. And for more information on the SpaceX CRS-11 mission, please visit www.nasa.gov slash SpaceX. And more information about the International Space Station, www.nasa.gov slash station. Thank you very much for coming.